right. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to be here. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, you've met my team, actually. I removed that slide, put it in the previous talk, but we have a multidisciplinary team of surgeons, um, and that's what's needed to treat this type of disease. You need not only a surgical oncologist, colorectal gastric, and I do liver and pancreas also, but you need people who are focused on uh, specifically on liver disease, lung disease, and so on. Um, additional disclosure is uh, that this is uh, surgery for metastatic disease in general is a um, very nuanced topic. Um, you don't have a very sort of a uniform group of patients, and there's not a single trial um, that can help you uh, treat these patients. So with that being said, this type of treatment surgically is more of an art than a science. So it requires nuanced decision making, and that's kind of the purpose of, of the talk is to share some of the, the thinking and the decision making that, that we use. You need to be logical and make real world compromises often when it comes to patient you know, decisions, uh, insurance issues, and so on, at least in the US. And you have to be open to change because uh, even when you plan your, your uh, treatment, often the best plans will change. Or here, here's that slide, so here we are again. Um, again, colorectal cancer, I'm not going to go on with this too long, is a common cancer. Up to 25% of patients will present with synchronous liver metastatic disease. Um, again, the most common sites of metastatic disease are liver and lung, liver being more common, at least for colon. Um, Two-thirds will have liver-only metastatic disease, which is a unique phenotype, a uh, more curable phenotype. In patients who've had their primaries resected uh, for cure, 15% will present with metachronous liver disease, and often these recurrences, systemic recurrences, will be early. The earlier, basically, the, the worse the outcome. So the overall approach to treatment, again, speaking globally, is multimodality therapy and what we emphasize always is early systemic therapy. Surgery is needed for palliation and uh, sometimes cure. Uh, we can use uh, radiation selectively, particularly for rectal cancers. Um, there are other modalities, uh, SPRT for lung, uh, chemo, and other types of embolization for, uh, for liver. Um, and again, the treatment of these cancers needs to be individualized. Uh, there's no one trial that will guide you. You have to have a comprehensive understanding of the data and always requires a team approach, preferably in the setting of a multidisciplinary tumor board. And my, I have two messages for the talk. I'll get to the second message. But uh, the first message is for, to treat these patients, especially if you're striving for cure, you have to have, use all means necessary. Um, um, so what are the factors that determine the type of surgery and the timing of surgery? There are a few questions you have to ask yourself. Is this a colon or a rectal primary? Is the surgery that you're going to do for palliative intent or curative intent? Uh, which organs are involved? You have to have a thorough understanding of how extensive the disease is. For curative intent, obviously, we want liver-only disease, but we can also treat low-volume extrahepatic disease as well for cure. Another question, is the primary disease and, and actually the metastatic disease as well asymptomatic or symptomatic and this will affect uh, what you do before you go on to systemic therapy? Oops. So it's very important to understand the extent of disease very thoroughly before you start treatment, before meaning any kind of treatment. So you have to have a complete colonoscopy if you can, the patient's not obstructed. Rigid proctoscopy, again, for rectal cancer to understand the distal extent of the tumor. Contrast CT scans. We use uh, PET scans selectively but liberally. Uh, with respect to liver disease, uh, you have to use, uh, at least we prefer MRI of the liver with uh, uh, a contrast and specifically to understand the extent of um, the disease, so every single lesion that exists, every single lesion anatomy, MRI of the pelvis for staging of rectal cancer. And we use, I should say I use uh, diagnostic laparoscopy very liberally. And I tend to be the one to place portacaths for these patients often 
So at the time of Portacath, if there's any suspicion of peritoneal disease, they will get uh, diagnostic lapros laparoscopy. And the benefit of that is oftentimes, especially for liver-only metastatic disease, we will do an intraoperative liver ultrasound at the same time to completely understand the disease before we start treating. Everybody gets uh, molecular testing, MMR, PDL1, next-gen sequencing. Incidentally, I don't know if we do HER2 testing for colorectal cancer, so I have to get back on that one when I get home. Um, but uh, so uh, who are the curable patients? And when you see uh, patients with metastatic colorectal cancer, you will see three groups of patients, all right? So the first group is they come to you, they're unequivocally unresectable, incurable, and they have either bilobar, extensive liver metastatic disease, um, although those can be potentially curable, but or um, extrahepatic disease, liver, lung, bone, um, uh, peritoneal disease. The second and third group of patients are the ones we, we target for cure. Those are the ones that have primary and metastatic disease that is resectable at the time of diagnosis, or the third group potentially resectable after response to systemic therapy, and most of our patients fall into that third group. Um, obviously, liver-only metastatic disease is uh, the most curable. What I would say about liver-only metastatic disease is up front, you need to have a plan for every lesion, um, uh, basically to affect a cure. Um, low volume extrahepatic oligometastatic disease, uh, especially lung disease, is potentially curable. But again, you have to have a full understanding of the extent of disease, and you need to have a plan, whether it's resection, ablation, radiation, ablation, whatever it is, for every lesion in order to, and this has to be up front, in order to have the best chance for cure. And basically, curable patients tend to be systemic therapy responders. Non-responders, very difficult to cure. Um, incurable patients, I'm gonna talk about, uh, I'll briefly talk about palliation, but uh, we'll get palliative surgery occasionally. And what do we pal palliate in GI cancers? Obstruction and bleeding. Uh, we do not palliate pain with surgery because surgery causes more pain. So um, um, you have to get away from that. As far as obstruction, rectal cancers, you have to use ostomies very liberally. Uh, you have to get away from the mindset of resecting these patients, especially for palliation. Uh, stents are reasonable. I almost never stent for potentially curable patients. We'll talk about that. Colon cancers, resections are reasonable for palliation um, if the patient is fit. Again, if the patient is not fit, liberal use of um, ostomies. Uh, for bleeding, rectal cancers, we generally radiate. For colon cancers, uh, resection or embolization, resection in fit patients will um, embolize in unfit patients. And the goal of palliative surgery, you have to understand, is to fix the problem with the lowest morbidity intervention that you can do so that you can get them to systemic therapy. If you do a high morbidity intervention, there are two things happen. Number one, you either delay or completely eliminate systemic therapy. And number two, you generally don't help the patient because you end up doing a, a suboptimal uh, resection. So you've decided that you're going for cure, and this is what I'm gonna focus on for the rest of the talk. Um, what are the considerations? So these are the questions we ask, and we can talk about them for an hour each. So systemic therapy or resection first. Okay, you've decided to resect or you're at the point of resection. Do you do a staged resection or do you do a combined resection, meaning primary and metastatic disease? Okay, if you're gonna stage it, do you do the liver first or do you do the primary first? Okay, once you get to the liver, do you ablate or resect? And I can go on and on. Do you do a non-anatomic resection versus anatomic? Ablation, do you use microwave radio, radio frequency? A lot of questions to answer. We're gonna briefly touch on these. So. Systemic therapy versus resection first. This applies basically to pay people who are resectable up front, all right? So I would say in my practice, in most practices, we prefer preoperative chemo, especially in poor oncologic risk patients. It allows for patient selection as well, meaning people will, who progress on chemotherapy are not gonna be good candidates for cure. Some benefit for, uh, uh, or some evidence for benefit with this approach, but not particularly data-driven. Um, um, surgery first is reasonable in a well-selected group of patients, and I will say that this is the minority of patients. 
Uh, patients who are symptomatic, let's say with colon cancer that's easily resectable, they have low volume metastatic disease, you can go on to do um, a combined resection up front. And this avoids the dilemma of what's called the disappearing liver met, which frankly is not much of a dilemma. And I'm not gonna get into it, but we can find all these lesions with the uh, uh, ultrasound. Staged versus synchronous resection, all right? The older data, and I haven't cited it, but demonstrated a higher morbidity with major hepatic resections, which is greater than two segments combined with colorectal resection. So the newer data, meta-analyses and so on, basically demonstrate that combined resections are safe. And in our practice, we will do as much surgery as the patient will tolerate and it's not a very simple question because a lot of times these patients will require multiple operations for their metastatic disease. So oftentimes we may not necessarily combine their surgery with the first liver operation, but we will combine it with the second. Um, liver first versus primary first. So I would say the data is mixed. Some data to suggest liver first approach is better. Um, in general, probably doesn't matter as long as all components are performed safely. But again, the, the way to get a patient through this is to perform the lowest morbidity operation first. Because if you have a high morbid, uh, a morbid operation, they will not continue to get the other uh, uh, portions of care. So in our practice, we prefer a liver first approach. Why? Because if you can't clear the liver, then the primary is not important unless it's symptomatic. Um, and the biggest, you should not do a morbid rectal operation unless the metastatic disease is controlled. So in my patients, the rectal operation comes last. Uh, this is a chapter we co-authored, or I co-authored in uh, the HPBA textbook. Um, they asked me to write a chapter on uh, resecting the primary first, and the chapter was actually not anything but that. It's not chapter one, so if you read the text, this is the proof. Um, it's like chapter 16 or 18 or whatever it is. But we, the way we divided the decision making is based on the primary location, colon or, or rectum, all right? So if the tumor is in the colon and the patient is asymptomatic, we always prefer systemic therapy up front. Response is a predictor of outcome as, as we've discussed. If the primary is symptomatic, let's say the patient is obstructed, if they're medically fit, they get a resection. If they're medically unfit, again, we tend towards a very liberal use of ostomies. If there's a little liver lesion, we might resect it at the same time, but in general, we, we, we try to, again, get them to systemic therapy. Um, all patients will then go on to systemic therapy. Um, if they have a rectal cancer, um, again, rectal resections are more complicated. Uh, if you do a re rectal resection in a metastatic patient and they have a leak, whatever it is, they're not getting systemic therapy. Basically, you're, you've, you've affected their care. So all asymptomatic patients, Systemic, uh, systemic therapy up front. If they're symptomatic, then we will divert. Either an ileostomy or a colostomy, both of them work. If somebody's near obstructing, doesn't want an ileostomy, we can get them through without obstruction, then we might uh, consider chemoradiation up front. Basically, avoid any attempts at resections uh, at all. You can consider using stents. We don't like, I don't like, personally as a surgeon, I hate stents. If I'm going to resect, makes, um, uh, sphincter preservation more difficult and so on. So once you've basically done systemic therapy and it's time for the rectal operation, then you also have to consider upfront chemoradiation before you even go on to resection. Um, I'm almost done, sorry, uh, going a little long, but uh, as far as the type of resection, so just a few comments, resection, anatomic versus anatomic, makes no difference, you need a negative margin resection. Uh, ablation, versus, uh, so ablation microwave, which is what we prefer, versus RF ablation. Um, we prefer microwave, uh, much better ablation, uh, much lower recurrence rates actually uh, demonstrated uh, via trial. Uh, the other uh, um, um, modalities are not necessarily curative. SBRT is reasonable for lung. Again, any means necessary to eradicate the lesion. Uh, I'm not gonna go into this, but again, Resection versus ablation, um, all means necessary. It's again more of an art than a science. What the data shows is that for lesions less than three centimeters, they're equivalent for lesions 
larger than three centimeters, resection is likely preferable. But oftentimes you have uh, a lot more than just one lesion, so you, again, you kind of have to mix and match. Um, overall outcomes. So over 50% of patients who um, uh, have colorectal liver mets after metastasectomy uh, will recur. Uh, half of these recurrences are intrahepatic and they're potentially salvageable, uh, and half of them tend to be uh, extrahepatic and unsalvageable. Um, so in well-selected cases um, where all the disease is cleared, we have five-year overall survival of about uh, approaching 50%, and that's true for both liver and lung disease. So summary and uh, general thoughts. So again, um, as far as decision making, uh, the, way the, the way these patients have the best chance for cure is if they receive every component of therapy and your basically job is to make sure that they get through the entire course of their therapy with the lowest morbidity. So lowest morbidity, uh, morbidity interventions first. We prefer early systemic therapy with respect to surgery. Always prefer the control of metastatic disease first. Um, you have to avoid morbid operations on primary disease. Why? Because you have increased complications that will delay systemic therapy. And you tend to do suboptimal resections. You don't help any patient by resecting a tumor and having a positive margin. Um, so again, if you think that uh, you're going to have a positive margin, difficult resection, just divert and get on to systemic therapy. Um, sy symptomatic patients for rectal cancer, diversion. For colon cancer, consider resection if you can do negative margin. And then as far as type of liver surgery, resection is best, but you mix and match. Again, an art. Um, and then combined surgery is reasonable. Um, I have a few cases. Do you want to present them now, or do you want to, David? Do you have to? Oh, is it? Do you want me to present them afterwards? Anybody? In? Uh, five minutes. Yeah, it's just, uh, so it just, these cases are not meant to discuss. They're meant to basically uh, uh, show our approach. So this was a 59-year-old patient, uh, female, who presented with an obstructing upper rectal cancer, PMMR. All these patients are PMMR, by the way. She had multiple bilobar liver lesions, no he extrahepatic disease. Um, I don't show the full extent of her metastatic disease, but she had quite a few lesions. This is her CT scan. The tumor is actually very infiltrative, and you don't necessarily see it on the scan. So uh, I started with the diagnostic laparoscopy because she was obstructing. And my initial intent was to consider resecting her. But as soon as I looked at the tumor, I stopped. Basically, I, uh, we did a diverting ostomy. And we used the opportunity to do an intraoperative liver ultrasound. And she got a portacath at the same time. So that, that's one of the messages that I have is, hey, you know, you're, you're there, you're thinking about resection. If it's going to be morbid, stop, divert, and then get them onto systemic therapy. She started systemic therapy next week. She wouldn't have if she got a resection. Uh, she got eight cycles of systemic therapy up front, laparoscopic segment followed by uh, laparoscopic wedge resection segment 5-6, multiple right-sided ablations. And again, this is where you have to have a plan. Our plan was to leave the left-sided, left lateral segment lesions alone, come back for a left lateral segmentectomy. She ended up getting full theory, which frankly she did great on, but she had horrible toxicity. Um, and then the next operation, we ended up doing a, com a combined robotic, uh, I called it a high, I think it was actually a low anterior resection with, and I took down her ileostomy at the same time. We ended up ablating her left-sided lesions. She got Lonsurf of an Avastin. She didn't tolerate it. She's one of the 50% of patients who recurred in the liver but had a salvageable recurrence. So she, we ended up doing a CT-guided ablation. She's off chemo now, and uh, as of June, she's negative PET scan, negative circulating DNA, and she is Armenian, so her kids bought her a trip, um, I think, two months ago to celebrate. So another patient very similar, 58-year-old with obstructing rectosigmoid colon cancer, um, workup showed, again, liver-only metastatic disease, potentially resectable. Um, she wanted her primary out. Uh, she was also near obstructing. Um, so I did a diagnostic laparoscopy on her, and she wanted resection. Uh, but she had 
also a very infiltrative tumor and small bowel adherent to the mass. So again, I stopped. The, the diverting loop ileostomy, intraoperative liver ultrasound. She got a port cath uh, that admission not at the same time. She had systemic therapy with response. Uh, five months later, um, you know, we, I wanted to do a systemic uh, or liver first approach, but she wanted to go to her son's wedding uh, without an ileostomy. So I ended up doing uh, um, a laparoscopic uh, anterior resection, small bowel resection, ileostomy reversal. She did great. Went on to get her, went on to her son's wedding with a with a very painful incision uh, in her, at her ostomy site. But then she got a, additional systemic therapy, and then three months ago, uh, she had a liver ablation and she's now disease free. Last case, I promise. Um, so this is slightly different. So this patient actually came to me after he had started treatment. He was 59, had locally advanced mid to low rectal cancer, PMMR again. Tumor very low, about a centimeter above the sphincter. He had bilobar liver only metastatic disease. The largest lesion was not initially resectable and he had uh, lateral pelvic adenopathy or he has, uh, as you can see here. So he got systemic therapy up front, and he had a great response. Uh, he ended up getting all of his lesions um, in the liver ablated. Actually, no, he got a wedge and an ablation. Basically, his liver disease is cleared, but because he has such extensive um, uh, rectal disease, and because his sphincter is thre threatened, now we're moving on to the primary, but we're not going straight to surgery. He's, go he's getting chemo radiation up front. So this, he hasn't started this yet, but uh, if he has response to chemo radiation, he's also a candidate for organ preservation, which is particularly important because he has, he's at high risk for systemic failure. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much.